Rosarito. Hi everyone, welcome. I hope you can hear me. Let me unmute you all just for a second. Uh, let's see. We'll just wait one more minute. Welcome. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, good. I can't hear you, but I'm glad you can hear me. It's funny to give a talk to basically silent people, but I assure you as we progress and we get to the end, we'll make sure we have Q&A. And I want to remind you that sometimes it's hard for the hosts, I don't know why, to unmute people you can actually at the right time unmute yourself. If you go to the bottom left of your screen, you'll have a little microphone and we'll have a little Q&A. So why don't we get started because, you know, it's 6.03 and people will arrive and I'm delighted once again to see all of your happy faces. I know I'm competing with Netflix, Hulu, Amazon Prime, you name it, it's out there, I know that. So you've made an hour of your schedule devoted to this and that, that just thrills me. So uh, I just wanna say that again, it's, it's lovely to see all of you because so many of you come from different parts of my life. Some of you go back to high school, some are from college at Penn, others are part of my Pfizer family and others are friends I've made in New York, even in the last recent years, and, and many, many more. Um, let's get started, and I'm gonna share my screen, and we'll get this going. Let's see here. Can you all see this? You can all see my screen now. Today's talk, um, well, before I start, I just wanna remind everyone, some of you know me well and others don't. I had the pleasure of having a really nice long career in corporate marketing, market research and sales. Um, and then after an unfortunate layoff, the silver lining was that I reconsidered what I wanted to do. And I always loved art history classes and I went back to school. I got a master's of Christie's education during that program, I loved the lectures on photography. And so I started looking into that and wound up being an intern at the auction house at Christie's in the photographs department. And that got me really even more into it. And then I got a job at a Chelsea-based gallery focused on photography. And then eventually what I wound up doing, as some of you know, is I started my own little tour guide, tour service, and I've taken groups of folks either to museums or galleries in New York to see all kinds of modern and contemporary art. 
And then now during COVID, of course, there's been this opportunity to look at some art, you know, virtually. Um, this Zoom has become just an, an enormous opportunity, right? So I can reach all of you, whether you're in Mexico City, California, and elsewhere. Some of you have been to my previous talks. Uh, they were focused on contemporary photography. Today, we're gonna take a little bit of a different journey. We're gonna go way back to the beginnings of photography, and we're gonna actually focus on women. And it's, it's a little bit of a crash course, I'm warning you right now. We're gonna cover a lot of ground. We're gonna cover about 150 years of photography in one hour. The focus I wanted to take was not only women, but I wanted to see women's photography about women. And I wanna be really clear, these photographers took photographs of all kinds of things. So it's a little bit biased. I'm kind of honing in on the photography they took of women. And hopefully through this journey in 150 years, we'll look at some of the evolution that has happened both in the role of women photographers themselves and also how they portray women throughout time. And I just want to remind you that this is uh, the fourth lecture and we'll have two more every other Wednesday. Please join me in two weeks for Art Photography of Children and Youth, which will be really fun. We'll look at works by folks like Lewis Hine and Helen Levitt and many others that have focused specifically on kids and youth. And then two weeks later, we're going to focus on what I'm calling photography on the fringe. So people that have chosen to really take photographs of people kind of that are rebels, outcasts, or subcultures. And I just want to make sure that everyone can hear me. Are you, you're good? Okay, so, so this one's fun because my master's is actually in modern and contemporary art and this one forces me to go way back and we're going back to the Victorian era in England. And we're gonna start with the woman that's credited for being the first ever female photographer. Her name was Anna Atkins. And by the way, I wanted to quote or reference a famous essay by Linda Nochlin. Linda Nochlin died recently and she was a scholar that focused on basically feminist theory of art history. And in her watershed essay in 1971, she asked, where have all the great women artists been? And the whole point of that is that we grew up with the Raffaellos, the Michelangelos, the Leonardos, and she was like, where were all the women? And in a very compelling essay, which by the way, I can send you, it's absolutely phenomenal. She basically says that this idea that artists are born geniuses was a big myth. The fact is, she lays out, women never had access to the institutions or the education or the training that all of the men had during centuries. Uh, so there's a reason why there weren't women artists. Um, the reason I wanted to mention that is because photography is a little bit different. First of all, it's a more medium, a more recent medium. And Anna Atkins is an example of someone that had access to photography practically from the moment it arrived. Um, as you may know, the earliest photographs were around the 1830s and 40s. And she, if you can believe it, had access to a camera by 1841. And I know we're gonna, we're gonna focus on women. I just wanted to very quickly show you what the first female photographer did, is she did what's called cyanotypes. She was a botanist and a photographer. And by the way, that's not such a coincidence because photography in its early days was almost a scientific chemistry project. It was about putting a material on paper that would be light sensitive, and then in this case, putting algae or ferns on that lights and sensitive paper and getting these beautiful images called cyanotypes, which by the way, the little factoid, this is where the, the, the name 
or the, the, the term blueprint comes from, whenever you've seen blueprints of your architectural images, it comes from this kind of material and light sensitive process. But let me move, uh, let's see, let me move ahead and let's start looking at Julia Margaret Cameron. So this is one of the first female photographers of the Victorian era that today you will still see at auction houses. And she was considered a huge innovator of photography. And um, I want you to notice the size of her camera. These were big, big cameras. You have had to use a process called wet plate collodion process where you would basically had to have these wet big glass plates and then you created prints that were the size of those plates. So hardly something you would run around with to document street photography. It was very much done, you know, inside in the studio and whatnot. And what Julia Margaret Cameron is known for are these gorgeous images that she took of people that she knew. This was a hobby for the upper classes. So this is, you know, early photography was about, you know, here I am, upper society lady in Victorian times, and I get to find either my niece or even my servants or friends to pose for me. And this image of Beatrice, which really is Beatrice, is her own niece, Julia. Um, and uh, it's referencing a character in a Percy Bysshe Shelley poem. So what was in mode or in vogue, let's say, in Victorian times is, I'm gonna create this image that has this wonderful soft focus. It's not you know, crisp and clear. It's got very emotional feeling to it. Her niece is dressed up with this hair piece and she's actually dressed up as an actual person that Guido Reni had painted way back. It was Beatrice Senchi. That was a woman that along with some other people uh, arranged to actually kill her very abusive stepfather and the Pope sent them to be executed. So there's this whole backstory to this. The whole idea is I'm creating a tableau vivant I'm not taking just pictures of people, I'm dressing them up and I'm looking at these kind of mythical or legendary past characters. In the Rosebud Garden, uh, sorry, uh, she is actually now taking a poem by Lord Alfred Tennyson, who was actually down the road and she knew, and she's taken these four sisters and she's dressed them up to be the characters of the Rose Book Garden, which is mentioned in Lord Tennyson's Maud poem. So this is really fascinating because it's all about creating this, this, this kind of artificial image. But if you look at it, it's very dramatic. It's very emotional. I learned that in Victorian times, when women wore their hair down, it was considered a very kind of sensual thing, right? It's kind of loose. And, um, and so this is what she was going for. This is what they called soft focus, again. Instead of getting the crisp clarity of facts, you're getting more feelings and softness and emotion. It's not that surprising because when you look at the art of the mid 19th century in England, the movement that was kind of in vogue was the pre-Raphaelites, like Sir John Everett Millay. And they were actually looking at characters, in this case, like Ophelia in Shakespeare's Hamlet. So it was very much about looking at these kind of legendary characters and bringing them back to life through these photographs. In this one, um, Lord Tennyson actually asked her, which is really remarkable, can you use your photography to create tableaus that are references to my poems, The Idols of the King. And this is an example of the very dramatic parting of Lancelot and Guinevere. And again, what's funny is that 
she would cast these and go around and find people that would be the right people to be Lancelot and Guinevere. And she had a Guinevere, but believe it or not, she couldn't find a Lancelot. And she finally found a guy that worked down at the pier who was a complete stranger and said, would you be my Lancelot? So here you've got, again, this is what Victorian era photography was about. Let's talk about Gertrude Casimir. She's a little bit different in that she's already, first of all, in the US, and she actually starts making money from her photography. You know, Julia Margaret Cameron, she became very, very well known, but she wasn't necessarily in the profession of photography. Gertrude follows and in a way is still connected to that whole art of elevating photography to be at the level of painting. I want to share with you that Kodak launched regular film and photography for people in 1888. So as you can imagine, people started going around and shooting just their friend, their neighbor, their mom, whatever. The pictorialist uh, artists of the turn of the century wanted to basically elevate photography so that it would get the respect of painting or sculpture. So as you can see, they're basically saying, well, our photography at an artistic level is gonna be much more compelling. It's gonna be really gorgeous. Once again, you see this beautiful composition the reference of blessed art thou amongst women, of course, is a religious reference. And Casimir is very interested in this Victorian devotion of the mother and child. So you see this beautiful composition, again, this soft focus. And by the way, the, the image in the back apparently is, you can't see it well, but it's the Annunciation. So there's still this referencing of kind of classical material to kind of elevate photography so that it gets respect. And she takes it even further. Imagine this photograph of the manger is obviously a reference to the nativity. And look at the, the beautiful kind of the way she captures this light coming in through the window. And you know, the beautiful contrast between the veil and the folds of this, this clothing with kind of the symmetry and kind of the hard material of, of the structure itself. And what's very funny about this is that it's this very beautiful, poetic, emotive image, and yet it's quite artificial because you're not gonna believe it, but this baby is not even a doll, it's just a bunch of folded towels or linens made to look like a baby. So there's a lot of setup and a lot of artifice here to again create this kind of very elevated image. Let's talk a little bit about Imogen Cunningham. I want you to notice the dates of her life because you could argue that she lived all the way from those days back in, you know, kind of the 19th century and all the way into what we almost consider contemporary photography. And so that's important to notice because she had a really long career and you'll see that her art evolves kind of in keeping with the stages of that photography. In her early works, and she was very much part of what I called the pictorialist movement. The pictorialist, she was friendly and a collaborator of Alfred Stieglitz and Edward Steichen. These were artists that were saying, again, let's elevate photography to this kind of glorious art that competes with painting. And in this in image of the dream, again, you still see this kind of heavy manipulation of the lighting and of the soft focus. Now, what happens with Cunningham, uh, she starts out in Seattle, eventually moves to San Francisco, and she becomes friendly with a lot of the more modern artists like Edward Weston and Ansel Adams. And they believe in straight photography. So they're anti-pictorialists. They want to actually capture the incredible and beautiful detail 
of objects in, K in Edward Weston. You may know his peppers and his lettuce leaves. And she became a major, you know, some of the things that, that she's best known for are these gorgeous images of flowers and botany. And she actually had a job documenting uh, botany. And these are these absolutely stunning close-ups of magnolias. And now you see that this is not pictorialism because it's about capturing every imaginable detail and close-up of these beautiful natural objects. Now, some of the artists of the era, like an Edward Weston, were actually taking photos of female nudes. And so, interestingly, she, she did the same. And, and these are actually stunning. If you look at, again, the detail and the lighting and the way the shade falls upon these two sisters. What's ironic, and I thought I would share, is that she had been quite cavalier. And in 1915, she shot her own husband near Mount Rainier in the nude. And the newspapers in Seattle caught, caught hold of this and gave her the worst time. It was like, how dare women <laughs> photograph nudes of men? That's absolutely outrageous. Who is this woman? And of course, it's ironic because, as we know, the male gaze and the whole history of men either painting or sculpting or photographing women is, is as old as antiquity. So here she was very daring. And it's like she got kind of her, her, um, her, her hand slapped, if you will, for doing that. The other thing that you'll enjoy knowing is that, of course, she became very interested in dancers. Um, talk about a subject matter that lends itself to beautiful photography because it's about the body and it's about movement. And here's a great example of an image that she shot of three dancers. And this in a way is reminiscent of what the famous photographer Cartier-Bresson had called the decisive moment because he was known for having coined the idea that, you know, with a photograph, you can capture this very, very precise moment in time. You know, these women are not going to be there anymore, you know, even five seconds later or five seconds before. And she captures this beautiful moment where the dancers are all in sync, up in the air, their, you know, skirts flying. And if you notice the, the shadows, the shadows on the floor are really beautiful. And, and she continues this, she actually makes a point of meeting the very iconic and famous dancer and choreographer, Martha Graham. And she spends a whole afternoon with her uh, taking some portraits of Graham. Uh, this one's very special because of course it has the whole drama of being a ballerina and her hands over her head. And again, look at what she does with the lighting and the contrast and the tonalities. And very interesting, then she goes away from the hands and the head and goes to probably the most important part of a dancer, which is Graham's feet. And dancers spend hours and hours practicing um, to the point that their feet are in tremendous pain. And I think this is really lovely, the way she kind of captures Graham's feet, which at the end of the day are a dancer's most prized tool of their body. And she also does a little bit of experimenting here. This is really clever. This is what's called double exposure. And she's captured Martha Graham, not only full bodied at the bottom, wearing this very dramatic kind of ballet cape, but then a big close-up of her kind of in the middle of, you know, a dramatic position. And it's fun because she's juxtaposed two images that are in such, you know, such different size. So one is full body and small, and the other one is this kind of larger than life image compared to it. And I want to close the discussion on Cunningham with this. I think it's, 
really clever and fascinating because it's much later, it's 58. I love this because it's still about women in a way, but the woman is gone and the woman is herself. This is a photograph of her unmade bed. And what I love about it is that all you know is that there's these bobby pins and objects left there that she obviously uses to <laughs> fix her hair. And if you notice the detail and the shadows and the creases of this bed, you know, normally we think of an unmade bed as like, oh God, I didn't make the bed today. And here you just think, my God, this is so gorgeous to behold. To the point that it made me think of the folds in Bernini's uh, mastery of, of Baroque art in the ecstasy of Santa Teresa in Rome, because Bernini and the Baroque it was able to capture those incredible folds in marble. And, and isn't it incredible that in photography, you're, you're able to almost capture that beauty of these creases and folds. Let's talk about Tina Modotti. And if you think she looks beautiful and like an actress, you're right. Tina Modotti was an Italian woman from Udine and she immigrated to San Francisco at the age of 16 with her father. And guess what? She got into acting and modeling. She was beautiful. And I thought I would throw this in because it's really fun. It kind of makes me want to see it. It's a movie, kind of a highlight of her movie career was a silent movie called The Tiger's Coat. And she was the femme fatale. And there she is in all her silent movie splendor. And I have to see if this is available because now I'm curious to see it. But what's funny is she became a model and muse for Edward Weston, who I had mentioned earlier. And I have to say, not only did she become a model and muse, but she became a mistress. And she actually, this is kind of, yeah, it's a little bit outrageous, but she wound up moving to Mexico when Edward Weston moved to Mexico. And she kind of followed along and he left his wife and kids back in California. So there's Weston in Mexico with Tina Modotti and they become very friendly with the avant-garde movement of Mexico. So we're talking Diego Rivera, Frida Kahlo, the muralists of the time, Clemente Orozco and others. And Tina Modotti falls in love with Mexico. It's an easy country to fall in love with. I'm biased because I'm from there. And she starts, you know, observing the people of Mexico. And here you have an example of, you know, the photography, she started taking very specifically photographs of the indigenous people of Mexico. Not, she wasn't doing, you know, portraits necessarily of the upper class. And here you have this beautiful image of a woman holding what we call an olla, which is basically a very large clay um, vessel, let's say. It can either be used for cooking or to carry, carry water. And, and look at what she does. You know, the backdrop is fuzzy and blurry. But then, you know, the, the, the olla is, looks so gorgeous with the light hitting it and this, this liquid kind of falling down. She takes pictures and photographs of things that, frankly, I grew up seeing in Mexico, because you still see this in Mexico, and it's women breastfeeding their babies right, right on the sidewalk. Um, so there's something very kind of beautiful and romantic and, and embracing of the culture of Mexico. And, and similarly to Frida Kahlo, as you know, Kahlo is known for having worn and really loved basically the, the clothing and the regional garb of the people of Mexico from a pre-Columbian era. So she's taking these photographs of women wearing those. But the thing about Modotti that you should know is that, and, and, and that whole group of avant-garde artists is they were very much communists. And, and not just slightly, they were, you know, and as we know, Diego Rivera's murals, Rockefeller pulled it down and <laughs> Rockefeller Center. And, you know, they, 
they were not looking just at the indigenous people of Mexico, but they were looking at the plight of workers and, and people uh, that, you know, were not doing so well. And this photograph, I think, captures it really well. There's this, you've got this Mexican woman standing very erect with one foot forward, almost as if she's ready to kind of move forward. And she's holding a flag. And I love the kind of the juxtaposition of the horizontal line behind her and this diagonal flag. And there's something very kind of revolutionary about it. And I will close the discussion on Modotti by saying that the Mexican government threw her out. In 1931, her photography career ended. It's really very short-lived from around 20 to 30. And she, along with other people in Mexico, were thrown out for um, being communists. I wanted to just mention that while Modotti was Italian and took a lot of images of Mexico, we do have our own uh, very much Mexican photographers of the post-revolutionary period. And Lola Alvarez Bravo is probably one of the best known female photographers of Mexico. So I wanted to make sure that at least if Tina gets some airtime that we recognize Lola Alvarez Bravo. And once again, very friendly and close to Frida. Here's Frida looking at herself in the mirror with, I think a lot of people think that Chihuahua is the official dog of Mexico. Believe it or not, it's these dogs, these hairless dogs called Soloid Squintle. And there's Frida with two of them. I love this image. It's this image of a woman at the kind of the ledge of her window and she called it en su propia cárcel, which means in her own jail. And there's something just incredibly painful and poetic about how what appears to be, you know, the perpendicular and, and kind of the, uh, the grid of the roof above her creates these shadows that almost make it look like she's trapped. And, you know, you wonder, she's trapped in a marriage, she's trapped as a housewife, is she trapped in Mexican society and unable to be elevated? But it's, you know, it's, it's really, really touching. And this is much later, but again, Lola Alvarez Bravo is documenting the lives of people in Mexico. And this image is, is really gorgeous. It's a burial. And you can see that, you know, these are the kinds of rituals that to this day often go on in Mexico. And all these women, of course, the men are ahead of them, the women are behind, but they're all wearing these beautiful white veils. And it almost looks as if, you know, as a community and as a ritual, they'll be able to support the spirit of whoever died. So we're about halfway. I'm glad you're, 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 you're with me still. I know this is a lot of material. I wanted to come back to the US a lot of you know Dorothea Lange. She's one of the most famous American photographers. Some of you know that during the depression, uh, there were a lot of programs that the government launched. Um, my editorial would be that right now we probably need some of those in the US, New Deal kinds of programs. One of them was called the Works Progress Administration. And as me, you know, a lot of artists were completely unemployed and they were given jobs. And in her case, she was sent out to document what was going on out in, in particular in the West of the US. And many of you know this iconic image uh, that Dorothea Lange, what's funny is that she had been taking photographs for weeks and weeks and weeks. And this was one of the photographs she decided to take almost at the tail end of her trip to the Dust Bowl. Dorothea Lange was documenting the plight of migrant farmers. And if you actually look at their stories and what went on, it's absolutely horrendous. These were people that basically traveled from place to place to try to be, you know, either pea pickers or pickers of whatever was available. But I mean, they traveled long distances with all their children and all their belongings. 
and they were basically local thugs and gangs that would beat them up and steal their stuff. I mean, the stories were awful. Anyway, Dorothea Lang was instrumental in making the, the country aware of what was actually going out there. Remember, this is pre-TV, this is pre-internet, so these images are basically the reality. And in the case of this woman, she bumps into her. She had 11 children, some of whom actually had died. Believe it or not, one of the um, things that she would do is she would consciously say, I'm not showing her with 10 or 11 children because that's not gonna be thought of as very nice. That's gonna be thought of as, well, stop having children, darn it. You know, <laughs> so I'm gonna show her just with a few of her children. Um, and by the way, I, I can't even believe this, but I think I've seen this image for years and we often forget there's actually a baby on her lap. So there's the two kitties and then there's this child. And so, of course, these images became instrumental in showing the government kind of the disaster that was the Dust Bowl combined with the Depression in the West. And by the way, there's tons of these. Uh, so I'm, that one became kind of the most iconic. And they often look a bit the same. I mean, look at this, like these women kind of looking, looking into the distance almost wondering, you know, what's going to happen to me and my children. Something that a lot of people don't know about, and not surprisingly, because these photographs were put away for 30 years by the US government. Dorothea Lang documented the relocation of thousands of Japanese Americans during World War II. And this was a very sad moment in U.S. history. Um, you, know, God, you know, God only knows we were fighting the Japanese and they were wreaking havoc and there was Pearl Harbor. But unfortunately, a lot of completely innocent Japanese Americans were sent to camps like Manzanar in California. And here you see the notices on the wall. Um, I mean, it's frankly very reminiscent of what happened to Jews back in Europe. And, you see this poor woman lining up to be taken away. You see these little children, I'm getting emotional, wearing tags, you know, because these tags, of course, are identification tags. And this little girl kind of minding the belongings of her family uh, before they're basically sent to the camps. Um, so very important photography. Again, we're looking at women. Now we're looking at women kind of in very kind of in crisis mode. But that's basically where Dorothea Lang was about. She was documenting some very difficult times in US history. Uh, moving quickly, because I'm, I'm aware of my, my timing here. Margaret Burke White, probably the hands down the biggest trailblazer of all photographers. Um, and this is because in a way she reached kind of the highest heights of photojournalism in the US. I'm not giving you too much of the detail of her upfront career. She had become a photographer of industrial structures for Fortune magazine. But I mean, this photograph just gives you an idea of how daring she was. This was like the photographer that said, nothing stops me. Women never did this. I'm gonna take photos from the top. That's the Chrysler, Chrysler building, by the way. She's above one of the, of the eagles. So as you can see, we've gone from Victorian era with Julia Margaret Cameron, you know, taking photos in her home of friends. And now we've got kind of like women embarking in these huge, lucrative, visible careers. She was the first photographer to be on the cover of Life magazine. And Life magazine is fascinating because again, at a time when there was no TV, no internet, Life magazine became like the magazine of images. It's almost like we're gonna bring the world to your living room and your kitchen through images. And Margaret Burke White, though, that, those, that's her photograph of Fort Peck Dam. 
one of her most famous images, you've probably seen this, is this incredible image of a flood that happened near Louisville, Kentucky. And of course, it's got this terrible irony. You know, you've got these African-American people waiting for food after a flood. And the billboard says, you know, there's no way like the American way, world's highest standard of living. You've got this white family with their pooch peering out of the window. So there's something just terribly painful and incredibly, um, well, just kind of like makes your jaw drop. Um, and then of course came, came the war and the preparation for the war. And, and again, here she's very much the photojournalist. She's looking at women making flags in Brooklyn. As you know, during the war and as we prepared for war, women's role changed and they went out and did all kinds of things outside of the home. And you've got here an amazing photograph of women in Indiana at a, at a steel mill. And I did want to acknowledge that this is all part of the Rosie the Riveter. You know, this was about women, <laughs> we can do it. And I think it's kind of fun because that was her attitude about being a photographer. I can do this too. I'm watching these women and I'm also going to be. And by the way, she uh, went off to Europe to document the rising fascism and Nazism of Europe. And so some of her images are really horrific because not only do you have the women getting ready for war in the US, you've got here, you've got young women in Romania, you know, that are part of the fascist rising youth group. And I want you to know that Burke White actually hung out with Patton and she basically insisted, I want to I wanna shoot combat. And she's really the first ever war correspondent that was allowed to be in the middle of combat, up on planes, basically shooting wars. So to this day, if you talk to like a Koki Roberts and photojournalists of recent times, they still think she was an absolute trailblazer. By the way, she got in trouble. Um, some of her images, she had gone to the Soviet Union. She wanted a document. You know, these people might be Soviets, but they're really not that different from us. That's actually Stalin's mother there. Um, she documented basically life in the Soviet Union. And that got her in trouble, as you can imagine, in the McCarthy era. She was named basically a kind of a communist sympathizer. So she went through all of the problems of having been involved with, you know, why are, you know, what are you doing taking photos of these people? Here, I, I, I kind of love this. It's a photograph of what appears to be a communist meeting of these elderly ladies in the US. So again, this got her in trouble. Uh, and by the way, they have a photo of a Native American and Lincoln in the backdrop, so it's quite fascinating. And then I'll just close Burke White with this image of, you know, a fully segregated school, of course, um, in 1949 in Montgomery, Alabama. But it just gives you an idea of the, the decades she spent and the breadth of her work. I'm going to try to speed up. I was a little bit ambitious. Now we're going to start moving into women photographers that really started doing something that's more like street photography. Lisette Model was born in Austria. And eventually, as things started getting really ugly in Europe in the late 30s, eventually moved to the US. Um, before moving to the US, one of the things she was famous for is she documented these really wealthy, kind of privileged, lonely people sitting in Nice in what's called the Promenade des Anglais. And she was almost fascinated by, here's these kind of lonely creatures that are very privileged and wealthy, but at the end of the day, they're, they're kind of lonely. And I should tell you that what she did 
very expertly as she cropped these images. So normally the negative and the image has all the people around the person and kind of puts them in context of where they are. And what she does is she crops it to almost make them look isolated and lonely. And of course, they're slightly unusual characters. You know, they look very wealthy. This lady on the left is smoking with her sunglasses. This heavy set lady there with her matching hat. And Lisette Mobel really looked for not only people she would bump into in the street, but she was really looking out for memorable characters, right? It's like, this is not just your average person. And once she's here in the US, imagine she's sent to Coney Island. And by the way, she's working for magazines. So these are working photographers that already have jobs and can actually have professions. And there's this kind of heavy set bather having a ball playing in, in Coney Island. And then this very famous image of a, this comes up at auction all the time, of a woman with a veil in San Francisco. And, and she's just this really unusual lady that she's kind of like dressed, you know, in this veil and this incredibly kind of like luxurious outfit sitting on a bench. And you'll not be surprised when I tell you who was her student because Lisette Mobel became an instructor of photography at the new school for 30 years. And her most famous student was our next photographer, Deanne Arbus. And as you well know, Deanne Arbus is probably the most famous photographer, female photographer of the 20th century. And not only is she famous, she's famous for photographing people that look marginalized, maybe unusual and different and out of the mainstream. And frankly, she learned that from her teacher. Imagine that since the 50s, Diane Arvis, oh, by the way, I just want to comment. Now you're talking about a Rolleiflex camera with a flash. So we're not getting into that too much, but you know, this is a kind of camera you, you can actually run around and find people with. That is not what Juliet Margaret Cameron was using at all. So there is a whole discussion about the evolution of cameras and who's using large format cameras with tripods versus cameras that enable documentary street photography. Diane Arbus um, starts documenting and I included this in, in a discussion of women taking photos of women because she was groundbreaking. She's taking photos of were, were back then female impersonators. This was very much groundbreaking. Um, and we'll talk about how controversial this was because some felt that Deanne Arvis was photographing all the people that no one else was willing to and giving them visibility and a voice. Others felt that this was voyeuristic and inappropriate and controversial and provocative on purpose. She looked for the unusual. Uh, you may know her famous photo of the twins. Here she's photographing some triplets. But again, there's, there's nothing happy about this. It's very raw, it's very unsentimental. And I should tell you that she would take a lot of photographs. And I assure you there's photographs of these triplets that are happier, smiling, and more becoming. And she actually chooses one that's kind of not so becoming and kind of troubling and unusual. She took photos of people in circuses. Um, she's got, you know, the tattooed man, the sword swallower. Here's the circus fat lady. I'm afraid to say that little dog looks just like my little Chico. And I was afraid if I don't do exercise during the COVID lockdown, I'm going to start looking like the circus fat lady here with my Chico. Um, she did things like go and take photographs at nudist camps. So it's about taking the photographs that no one else ever did. 
And by the way, she was nude while taking these. Because it's like, if you're going to be in a nudist town taking photographs, you better be nude. And she was known for becoming friendly and chatting with her subjects. You know, she's not, I'm just taking strangers. I'm going to hang out. I'm going to become friendly with these people in a very kind of empathetic way. Look at this photo of a woman she finds in the street. I can assure you this woman, she took more becoming photographs of this Puerto Rican lady. This one is not. And this is what she's known for. Um, and here's this really kind of unusual photograph of these two women in Coney Island. And they've got these matching bathing suits, but look at their look and their faces and their hair. And there's just something quite disquieting and unusual about them. I want you to know that in 1967, Arvis had her first show at MoMA it was part of a show called New Documents, and it was of three artists, Winogrand, Friedlander, and Arbus. And Arbus got most of the attention. By the way, I will also tell you that there was someone in the museum that had to wipe down the spit off of the photographs because in 1967, some people saw these and would actually spit on the photographs. They thought this was disgusting, outrageous, and nothing that should be in a museum. By the way, sadly, as some of you know, she committed suicide by 1972. It's, it's a fascinating biography. Uh, she was the daughter of wealthy, Jewish Soviet immigrants. They actually owned a department store called, is it Rus Ru Rusek's, Rusek's on Fifth Avenue. So she grew up a, a rich young woman, but again, she was focused on stuff that to this day is very haunting. And by the way, I'll close with this woman holding, it's not a baby, <laughs> talk about Madonna and child. This is Madonna with monkey. And, and so again, she thrives and looks at the unusual. Okay, we're almost there. I'm looking at the time. Nan Golden, now we're talking about artists that are still alive. Nan Golden is an artist that became famous because she photographed people that were right in her own immediate environment. When she was studying in Boston, and again, this references Arbus to an extent, when she was studying in Boston, she became enthralled by drag queens, cross-dressers. There was a bar in Boston called The Other Side, uh, and she hung out there and thought that this is amazing. There's, she actually called it the third sex. And she actually felt that the third, the third sex was almost like a privileged third sex because heterosexual relationships are so full of conflict. She was like, these people have found something really cool that's actually liberating. And this is Ivy wearing a fall. And this is black and white imagery from her Boston days. What Golden is most known for is her images of downtown New York, her immediate, what she calls her family of friends. And I've got a great quote. She talks about this family not being family that's blood family or family that she grew up with. It's the family you choose. It's the family of the East Village. It's the family of, of the clubs of the day of the 70s and 80s. She's very intrigued by people at clubs in her immediate circle. They're wearing vintage clothing. This is Trixie on the ladder. They're very intimate in a very raw way. It's like, I'm gonna take these friends as they take a pee break at the club. And by the way, I looked it up. The Mud Club was one of the very happening clubs of that era in New York. I'm afraid I, I got here too late for it. 
we're talking about a world of very fluid gender identity. We're talking about a world with heavy drug use. We're talking about a world that was ravaged, ravaged by HIV AIDS when the first cases of that appeared after 1981. So there's a very warm kind of intimate side to this. There's also a very painful, painful side to it. Uh, this is clearly someone, a friend that's on drugs, looking like she really needs a meal. I hate to say it, but not looking great. And even more dramatic, she documents her own self nine months after having battered by a boyfriend. And imagine, I keep thinking, if this is what you look like nine months later, imagine what she looked like when she was battered. And so she called this whole series um, The Ballad of Sexual Dependency. I just want to show you Misty and Jimmy Paulette. Jim, this was really Jimmy Paul, but he went by Jimmy Paulette. So this is an incredible time capsule of those days in New York, of the kinds of people in her immediate circle. And what you need to know is that the way she presented this, she would actually present it in clubs. And she presented it with a carousel as a slideshow of 700 images with music playing. And again, you're talking about incredibly intimate. I mean, here are friends actually having sex, doing drugs, peeing at the club. So there's something incredibly groundbreaking and intimate about this and painful. I was lucky enough to go to MoMA a couple of years ago. They set up a dark room with the carousel with the hundreds of images going by because the idea was, well, let's look at this the way Nan Golden meant it to be looked at. And I just want to throw in that Nan Golden today, some of you may know, is a real activist against the opioid epidemic, not, not against the epidemic, against those who she and many believe promoted it. So some of you may know that the Sackler family was the family that made fortunes with Purdue Pharma. And Purdue Pharma are the makers of OxyContin. And they've had to settle legally because they basically denied for years that, oh, OxyContin is fine, it's not addictive. And basically they're blamed for the opioid epidemic in the US. So what now Golden does is she goes to the Guggenheim, she goes to the Met, she goes to MoMA, she goes to everywhere. And they basically ask, because you know the Sacklers have been enormous philanthropists that have given a lot of money to museums. And what they've been asking is that the museums divest money from the Sacklers and no longer accept it. And I will tell you though, they've been very successful. The Louvre no longer has Sackler money. I think the Guggenheim no longer. This is a picture of one of the protests where they throw, you know, basically pill, pill bottles all over the museum with money and basically create basically a, a, an activist scene against that money. Oh my goodness, let me hurry up. We're down to just two artists. I wanted to take you to the complete other extreme. Nan Golden is documenting her intimate family in the clubs of the village, East Village. Tina Barney is like, you know what? I'm gonna document my inner circle, but I'm basically a rich upper class socialite. I can do this too. Tina Barney takes us to the world of the 80s and 90s and through to today, but it's the world of the very wealthy in New York New England and so on. And it's actually a very funny parallel. Just the way, you know, we were seeing Trixie and so on in the club. These are basically Tina, uh, Jill and Polly, you know, in their robes, in their beautiful, in their beautiful bathroom. Uh, we've got, oops, let me move this out of the way. Here's obviously a, what seems to be a funeral. These are very affluent. 
By the way, these are enormous color prints, the size of paintings. They actually go for a lot of money. It's a little bit funny because you're basically acquiring a really big image of people that to us are strangers. But this has become an become a iconic work in contemporary photography for this idea that she's capturing the rituals, the common rituals of the very wealthy. And one of the points she's trying to make is the wealthy do the same things that anyone else does. We have funerals, we have weddings, we, we're in rows doing our hair. Um, here's another of the photographs of her. So now, again, you're seeing these exquisite settings with these incredibly well-dressed people. And she's been doing this for 40 years, by the way. I'm gonna close, finally, with Catherine Opie. Catherine Opie is an artist that is a lesbian gay woman that had a series that was groundbreaking at its time. She traveled around the US and wanted to document families or couples of lesbian women. You know, just, it's basically portraiture. What's different and unique about it is that it's very casual, it's very intimate, and it's about lesbians around the country. And this is, she calls this, God, I can't see it with my, see, well, you can see there, it's Melissa and Lake in Durham, North Carolina. Or you've got, in the next one, you've got, uh, you know, these three women that, that live together. It's, it's a series called Domestic. And I think it's kind of bringing to the public and to like, you know, gay people, the LGBTQ community lives just like you. We've got our homes all around the country. Um, here's uh, Norma and Ayenga in Minneapolis. So this is quite a large series. Now I wanna warn you that the last images are pretty provocative. This is Catherine Opie doing some self-portraiture. She's someone that is not shy about the fact that she's into sadomasochism. She does self-cutting. This is a self-portrait of herself and some of the cutting that she did on her back. She's tattooed, she's heavy set, totally unapologetic about it. And to the right, and this is an image that you can see right at the Guggenheim in their collection, she's nursing her child. And what I want you to notice about this is that this is about a woman saying, I'm a lesbian, I'm unapologetic about it. I don't look that pretty perhaps by standard, Western standards of the nice, beautiful lady. And, and I'm, I'm tattooed and I'm nursing my baby. And it's my way of closing this talk by kind of commenting on not only women photographers and the changing role they've had, you know, all the way from photography being a hobby for the upper class ladies of Victorian England, but all the way to photojournalists like Margaret Burke White and on to now photographers like Catherine Opie that are, you know, traded at auction and at fairs. But the subject matter and the approach has changed in a very liberating way. Uh, I thought that this would be a really fun kind of contrast. On the one hand, we've got the Madonna and child of Victorian times with the beautiful lighting, and just kind of the soft emotion. And yet there's some artifice there, right? As we talked about, that baby isn't even a baby. It's actually a bundle of, of towels or linens. And then on the right, for better or for worse, not everyone may like it. It's this kind of very raw, liberated woman saying, I don't need any artifice. I'm gonna take a picture of myself nursing my baby. I'm also the Madonna and child. So I hope you've enjoyed that very fast journey. I know we're a few minutes past the hour. I'm so glad you hung in there. I hope that you learned a lot about women photographers and their changing approach to the subject of women. And now I'm actually gonna just remind you that I do have another lecture in two weeks. 
it's we're going to focus on kids you're going to see some amazing approaches to photography about kids do please spread the word and now i'm going to stop sharing my screen and i apologize about the time but i'm hoping i can unmute you and i hope that um we can um, hear your questions or comments. Let's see here. Let's see, Let's see. How do I unmute you all? Unmute. If you want to comment or or say or or ask me something, please go ahead and unmute yourself. I think you should be able to do that if you go to your bottom left. Oh, I'm gonna allow you to unmute yourself now. Any thoughts, uh, questions? I know that was a lot. Let me look at the chat too. I know there's some comments here. Yes, yes, absolutely right. I love, you're right, there's photos of Tina Morotti and Frida together hanging out. They were lovers as well. Uh, Frida was definitely known for being bisexual and even has images of herself dressed as a man and so on. It was again, a very liberal avant-garde world in Mexico. Um, let's see what else I see here. Oh my goodness, let me... Um, Oh, good question. Um, what's the difference between a platinum print and a gelatin print? Um, you know what, that the way uh, prints were made from the beginning was, well, historically was through making a surface, basically paper, light sensitive. And so what's happened is that over time, the chemicals or the materials used to make it light sensitive changed. Um, platinum prints were used for a short period of time, and guess what? Platinum's very expensive. So they're really not that different. What happened is platinum became expensive and people moved on to silver gelatin prints. And for the most part in the 20th century, the photography that we normally talk about, whether it's Ansel Adams, Arvis, Weston, and so on, um, is silver gelatin prints. Um, that, of course, changed dramatically in contemporary photography, where now you're using prints that use entirely different processes that are through, you know, ink jets. So it's not even about a paper with light sensitive anything on it. It's about basically a chromogenic process that, that's very complicated. It's more similar to you and I using our color printer at home. It's no longer the, the old kind of photosensitive paper. Let me see what, what other comments you've got here. I did see someone, Rick, saying that you're absolutely right. Um, the Ballad of Sexual Dependency is a reference to the Three Penny Opera. Um, in the case of Nan Golden, as you saw, she was beaten up. She had a lover that she, she basically says, I was completely in love, but he was basically an a-hole, but the sex was amazing. So she kind of chose the term of the battle of sexual dependency to almost reflect the kind of the, the pain that goes on with being a heterosexual woman that's in love with a man that's really not that nice, but you're actually very sexually <laughs> satisfied with them. And she chose that as the title of her hundreds of works. Does anyone want to try unmuting yourself? I, I'm getting nervous that you actually can't do that. I'm, I'm asking. We can't, oh boy, Let's see, chat, mute all more, allow participants, oh, it's crazy. I keep, I keep pressing mute, mute, 
it just says mute all, but it doesn't say unmute all. So that's, let me say, it allow, allow participants to unmute themselves. Can someone try now to unmute yes. yourself? Ah, yes, you are. Yeah. This is a dumb comment, but some of, I like those Nan Golden, uh, well, I like the, all the photos. This is great effort. Some of them almost reminded me of Desperately Seeking Susan. I don't know why, just that, that film with Madonna and not so much the ones where she was used up, but the 1970s uh, East Village. Jim, I think it's a great comment because um, Nan Golden talks about how she was fascinated by almost the theatrical identities of that time. You know, it was about going out to the club with vintage <clears throat> clothing that you bought. And as you remember in Desperately Seeking Susan, um, uh, you know, uh, there's a scene in the famous vintage clothing shop in these village where they go in and they're buying like just the right jacket. So it is very much, by the way, in some of her portraits, you actually see masks in the background that are references to the idea that people like Marilyn Monroe or Andy Warhol were creating these personas that are very theatrical. So you're absolutely right. There's that whole kind of the, the, the stage that is the East Village clubs. You know, if you went to the Mutt Club or you went to, I think it was Nell's, um, you kind of get dressed up and, you know, you're out creating a persona. Other, other comments or questions? Efren, I'm curious, who are some of your favorite emerging photographers who are young and who, who you feel are carrying on the tradition that these women pioneered, either subject matter wise or, or approach or stylistically? Um, well, you know, we didn't cover, so regarding, it's funny, I, I almost had to make a decision, this, this, this talk wound up being very Western. As you saw, it was England, the US, Mexico, period. Um, I almost had to make kind of an executive decision. There's amazing current female photographers in other countries, like Zanele Mupoli in South Africa. Shireen Neshat, as you know, is not just a photographer, but she's done photography. So I, I thought that there would be fun <clears throat> to do a separate talk that's almost about non-Western contemporary female photographers, because I think some of their work is amazing, yeah. and I really didn't include them here. Yeah, it was just really well. They're still doing work as we speak, and they, they do amazing stuff. But she's shaking his head. Any, uh, uh, I hope that answered you a little bit. Tina. <laughs> Anyone else? I'm going to pick on people. I realize we're we're at the end of the hour, but um, uh, any other comments or thoughts? Uh, as you saw again, this was um, there. There are amazing women photographers like Berenice Abbott that I didn't include. Uh, there are women like Annie Leibovitz. I initially included her, and then based on time, I had to take her out. Uh, so, so many more. I, I was almost having to just narrow this down to kind of a quick tour. Um, and I would say again that, that I was focused on the way they took photographs of women, but that's not to say that these photographers were only focused on the women by, by any means. I have to say, I would have to say that I am very impressed with with the early women photographers. Last night, I happened to be watching a PBS program about the suffragettes without ever really being completely aware of all of the, the, the terrible years that it took for women to finally get themselves the vote. And by watching the early photographers, the female photographers that none of us have ever heard about, um, really makes me feel very happy to see mm -hmm. women finally being recognized. Yeah. You know, as, as I, as I didn't, I didn't elaborate too much, but in the Linda Nocklin essay that I mentioned, uh, 
she, it's incredible because she, you know, there, again, as I said, there's this idea that, oh my God, for centuries, men were the artists, men were geniuses, they were born geniuses. And her whole point is, no, you're not born an artist. You actually, you know, for years, um, the best art schools didn't allow women. And you know what? Let's face it, now you can do art without being an incredible draftsman. But years ago, it was all about if you campaign to the human body, you know, a male nude or a female nude, you can be an artist. And that's not stuff you would just learn on your own. You had to go yeah. and actually have access to male or, or female nude models and be an apprentice and be, you know, be, be in these schools and learn that. And women never had access to it. It's a fun essay because you learn. She gives examples of the women artists that actually broke through, like a, for instance, uh, if you go to the Met, there's a huge painting by Rosa Bonheur, which is of the horses at a horse market or a horse fair. She actually had to go and dress up like a man and go to the horse market to study the anatomy of horses <laughs> so that she could actually make paintings of horses. Um, someone like Bert Morisot, who's an impressionist artist that also broke through when she's a woman, well, she was related to one of the other impressionist artists. So she makes the point that if you were a woman, you better at least be related to a, to a male artist or you better disguise yourself as a male because otherwise you were not going to get an art education. Photography in a way was different because it, it's not about draftsmanship and it's not about having to learn as an apprentice looking at models. And so in a way it became more readily accessible for women. By the way, when, when Julia Margaret Cameron was getting kind of her name around, men didn't like her photography. They felt it was, technically it was not very impressive. Her prints had sometimes her fingerprints or were kind of fuzzy or imperfect. And of course the men would poo poo it and say, well, you know, she's trying her best, but it's not so good. By the time you're looking at Gertrude Casimir, she was, you know, like, well regarded and got accolades even from the men and they were like this lady she really wow this is an impressive stuff you know? and it is also um interesting when you think about um I'm, i hope i'm using the right words in english but in spanish it's perfectly clear but you know in developing a women artists, um, in many of the arts, women actually began doing this, uh, you know, um, sewing or, or painting or as a pastime. It was like considered a soft art where they could participate. You know? <laughs> so watching the way you presented this and seeing how it went from a hobby to an actual profession, it, it was also very interesting the way you brought it together or, or como lo tejiste, how you, mm. how you Rosa, did it. <laughs> but you're making a great, you know what, you, you hit it on the nail because when you talk about Gertrude Casabier and some of those early women photographers, they were part of and huge fans of what was almost called the rise of the arts and crafts movement and moving it kind of front and center into the arts. So, there were women that were weaving. There were, you know, in the Bauhaus in Germany, famously women were, were doing like, Annie Albers was doing weaving and doing stuff with fabric. So things that women had been almost relegated to, oh, well, you, you be over there and do arts and crafts. These women actually said, well, hold on. They're not just arts and crafts. They're actually, this is art too. So I, I think it's a great, great point. Yeah. Any other any other thoughts? Thanks for staying on and for a little discussion. Thank you. It was excellent. Thank you. I'm Thank you, say everyone. Goodbye. Yeah, you're very welcome. Really great. Thank and you. And I hope to see you in two weeks. Absolutely.
and we'll see a lot of photography about kids and youth, some of it very innocent, some of it very troubling. Um, but, you know, uh, I think you'll, you'll enjoy it. All the way from, you know, Lewis Hine documenting child labor, which was horrendous, you know, before child labor laws went into place, he went around and we'll see photographs of kids working in factories at the age of nine or 10, um, stuff like that. Um, all the way to Larry Clark documenting his life as an IV drug user with his friends in Tulsa. So a lot of, again, very interesting looks at, at kids and youth. So have a good evening and thanks again. Thank you, Ephraim. Thank you, Ephraim. Thank you.